Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a very interesting one on the promise, God's everlasting covenant. This particular lesson is lesson number 11 in that series for June 12 of 2021, entitled New Covenant Sanctuary. New Covenant Sanctuary. Hmm. Let's see what that implies. We, as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have come together here to talk about your word, about your the things that you prepared for us to study in this Sabbath. Help us to understand clearly the issues that are involved and, and how we can become more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. In this lesson, we will try to discover what we can learn about salvation from the Old Testament sanctuary and its services. Notice these important words that should give us a little bit of a flavor for the whole experience. Hebrews 10, verse 1. The Jewish law is not a full and faithful model of the real things. It is only a faint outline of the good things to come. The this, this same sacrifices are offered forever, year after year. How can the law then, by means of these sacrifices, make perfect the people who come to God? That's from our American Bible Society. And then, what steps has God taken to help us fallible, doubting humans become more like Him? Exodus 25.8 made it clear to the children of Israel that God wanted to dwell in the midst of them. So why, why does God want to do that? Jim? Le Leviticus 26, 11, and 12. I will live among you in my sacred tent, and I will never turn away from you. I will be with you. I will be your God, and you will be my people. Good news Bible. Our Bible study guide and my theology hold very different views about the topic for this week, including why Jesus had to die. Let's look at those slightly different, somewhat different views. Our Bible study guide suggests that the sanctuary provides the means by which fallen, un, fallen sinful people can be accepted by the Lord. That's one of the issues. And why that is so important. What does that have to do with forming a covenant? And especially what does it mean to be accepted by the Lord? Is he against us? What would it take to change his mind? Leviticus 1 through 7, which would be an incredible experience if we had time to go through all of that and see what we learn about all those sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament, give a detailed account of all the sacrificial offerings that were supposed to be offered in the ancient sacrificial system. In that system, there was a lot of bloodshed. So what was, quote, the role of the blood, Carrie? The person who had sinned and thus had broken the covenant relationship and the law that regulated it could be restored to full fellowship with God and humanity by bringing an animal sacrifice as a substitute. Sacrifices with their rites were God-appointed means to bring about cleansing from sin and guilt. They were instituted to cleanse the sinner transferring individual sin and guilt to the sanctuary by sprinkling blood and reinstituting communion and full covenant fellowship of the penitent with the personal God who is the saving Lord. And that's from our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide. Is Anybody? that one of the places that you differ from the theology <laughs> of the well, Bible study guide? Well, let's say it looks, sounds to me like it differs from what the Bible says. Yeah. Look at that, these two verses, taken from the book of Hebrews again, we already read in, he, in Hebrews 10, verse 1, that that old sanctuary system was just a faint shadow. Well, look at 10, verse 4 and verse 11. For the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. But, and then down in verse 11, but these sacrifices can never take away sins. And our Bible study guy just said what? That's exactly what it does. Yes. Well, Hebrews 10, verse 3 says, The sacrifices serve year after year to remind people of their sins. What did they do? So is that the purpose of the sacrifices from the Old Testament system? Well, let's, let's look and let's see if that's a possibility. Uh, look at Isaiah 53, 4 to 6. 
but he entered, he endured the suffering. This is, of course, the famous passage in Isaiah that Christians take to mean uh, is a to take as a prophecy of the coming Messiah. And you can see two sides sort of represented here. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, so he has taken our place apparently. The pain that we should have borne, he took our place. All the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. Now, if, if we need, if somebody needs to do something to get us accepted again by the Lord, does that fit with the idea we thought that his suffering was punished sent by God? But because of our sins he was wounded, be beaten because of the evil we did, we are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, and the punishment all of us deserved. So we've got some contradictory kind of ideas going here. This prophecy from Isaiah, which Christians believe is a prophecy of the future life and death of Jesus, strongly suggests that Christ took our place. What does that mean? Without the plan of salvation, every one of us would die. God's plan makes provision for us if we accept his conditions to return our allegiance to him and have eternal life. What a substitution. Isn't that the real substitution? Seems like it to me. The Old Testament animal sacrifices were, and now this again, we're, gonna, we're going back and forth here. This is another section from our Bible study guide, so see what you think of what this says. The Old Testament animal sacrifices were the divinely ordained means for ridding the sinner of sin and guilt. Is does, that that true? does that conflict with what we just read from Hebrews? They changed the sinner's status from, what, from that of guilty and worthy of death to that are forgiven and reestablished in the covenant God human covenantal God human relationship. Well, maybe, but there was a sense in which the animal sacrifices were prophetic in nature. After all, and no animal was an adequate sacrifice, uh, adequate substitute in atoning for humanity's sin and guilt. Paul states it in his own language. It is, and now they quote this. It is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. But yet, they carry on. Mm -hmm. Thus, an animal sacrifice was meant to foreshadow the coming of the divine human servant of God, who would die a substitutionary death for the sins of the world. It is through this process that the sinner is forgiven and accepted by the Lord, and the basis of the covenant relationship is established. That's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide from Monday, June 7. So we see that our Bible Study Guide suggests that the ancient sanctuary system provided a key to salvation, while the Bible verses reference, to, reference seem to disagree. Gordon? In Galatians 1, 4 from the Good News Bible, in order to set us free from this present evil age, Christ gave himself for our sins in obedience to the will of our God and Father. <coughs> and Romans 8, 3, what the law could not do because human nature was weak God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son, who came with a nature like sinful human nature, to do away with sin. Now, that also is from the that, news Bible. What? That's from, yeah. Wouldn't that be a solution if God could figure out how to do away with sin? I mean, doesn't that sound like a solution to you? There's no question, or Gordon, go ahead and read that. There is no, this is from the Bible study guide. There is no question one of the key themes, if not the key theme of the New Testament is that Jesus Christ died as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And that is one of the questions we're trying to deal with here. That's an opinion mm -hmm. that the uh, Bible study guide suggests. Mm -hmm. This truth is the foundation of the entire plan of salvation. Again, an opinion. Any theology that denies the blood atonement of Christ denies the heart and soul of Christianity. A bloodless cross can save no one. So that's our Bible study guide for Tuesday, June 8. Again, this is a claim. There's no supporting evidence given. That's a pagan point of view we paradigm. Will. Okay, so why would you say it's a pagan point of view? 
Let's say you've got to do something to change God's mind is basically. Yeah, the pagans did all sorts of stuff, cut themselves and carried on and shouted and danced and offered things and even sacrificed their own children to appease God and to get him to change his mind. They're, they're gods. That's a pagan approach. If we think the sacrifices need to be offered to change the mind of God, that is basically a pagan idea. And also, I would suggest that everything, when they've used the word atonement, it's a mispronunciation of something that was, it's a made up word, which really means, means at one minute. Yeah. Now, some people say, we can think of certain ones, that uh, Jesus' uh, death on the cross was for an atoning sacrifice. In fact, some of the Bible, Bible translations say yeah. that. But really, Everything God has done from the time he began to create is to bring in harmony all of his intelligent creatures. Mm -hmm. And that's a state of at one to be at one, in harmony with. There's other adjectives okay. that we can use. Jim, I'm going to give you a chance to talk about one of your favorite verses here. What does this mean to you, what you, we just read? Do we know why Jesus died? Jesus himself told us why he died. Well, he tells us why he was here. Two thousand yeah. years. Uh, several places he tells us why he was here. We're, we're getting there. Go ahead. Okay. Jesus himself told us why he died. John seventeen verses three to six. And eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Now, there's nothing there about blood. No. This is. These are Jesus' own words. Okay. I have shown your glory on earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. Father, give me glory in your presence. Now the same glory I had with you before the world was made. I have made you known to those who gave me, to, to those you gave me out of the world. They belong to you and you gave them to me. They have obeyed your word. You could say they have listened to your yeah. word. So what did Jesus say? He said, I have finished the work, the work you gave me to do. I have made you known, God, um, well, to those you gave go, out of the world. We go back to John 14, 9. Yeah. Philip says, show me the Father. He says, yeah, I've been here with you all this time, and you asked me, show, show the Father? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. <laughs> well, those were Jesus' own words. I, of course, we didn't hear the way he pronounced it, but I, I see, have to think that he wanted to emphasize those. And I, we can tell you, I can just tell you plain and simply, the difference between what we read in our Bible study guide, which is the evangelical Protestant approach, versus what we're going to emphasize a little bit more in this lesson, the evangelical Protestant approach leaves out the great controversy completely. It's like it never happened. So that's why we're going to take a little bit different approach here. So how could Jesus have finished the work before he died on the cross if blood was needed for, for salvation of humans? Paul is the only one in the scripture who makes an attempt to explain directly why Jesus had to die. And that's those famous verses in Romans 3, 25 and 26. Carrie? God offered him so that by his blood, and there's a footnote there, in GNB 3, 25 to 26. By his blood or by his sacrificial death. So they're saying that the, the word blood here is, is used to imply a sacrificial death, okay? He should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. Okay, now let me interrupt for a second. Is Paul trying to explain here why Jesus had to die? God did this in order to, doesn't that kind teach, of like, sound teach. like an explanation? It's like teaching, he said, demonstrate, teach, show. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. In the past, he was patient and overlooked people's sins. But in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. In this way, God shows that he himself is righteous and that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus from the Good News Bible. So and notice it says, in, um, in the present time, he deals with their sins. 
Romans 8, 3 said what? Jesus came to deal with sin, right? Here it is again. Okay. Notice that Paul said three times that the purpose of the blood, that is the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, was to demonstrate God's righteousness. And then finally he said it is to put right everyone who believes in Jesus. Well, those who accept the great controversy, trust healing model of the plan of salvation, believe that Christ came primarily to reveal the truth about God. Gordon, can you tell us about that? This is from Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890, in several paragraphs there. And that would be the words of Ellen White. Yes. <coughs> Christ came to represent the Father. We behold, we behold in him the image of the invisible God. He clothed his divinity and, with humanity and came to the world that the erroneous ideas Satan had been the means of creating in the minds of men in regard to the character of God might be removed. Okay, let's back up for a second. Has it said anything yet about paying for our sins? Nope. No. Okay. Next paragraph. Satan sought to intercept every ray of light from the throne of God. He sought to cast his shadow across the earth that men might lose the true views of God's character and that the knowledge of God might become extinct in the earth. He had caused truth of vital importance to be so mingled with error that it had lost its significance. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions, and God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. Okay, now let's stop here a moment. Let's, we, we're, we're, we're ahead of our schedule a little bit. What, what does this quotation from Ellen White say? It says, there was a great controversy going on. And what was the great controversy about? God's character. And who was misrepresenting God's character? Lucifer was misrepresenting. The one who used to be standing next to God's throne, okay, is now Satan, uh, the adversary, or Diabolos, uh, the devil. Okay, go ahead. So again, God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. Okay, I'm going to interrupt such again. Such as hell. Yeah. The traditional view of hell. Yeah. Wouldn't you love to worship a God like that? <laughs> Not really. More of an awful... <laughs> Terrible idea. High percentage of them. Many people have such, such a picture. Yeah. Yes, they do. The, Shall I continue? Yes. The very attributes that belonged to the character of Satan, the evil one, represented as belonging to the character of God. Jesus came to teach men of the Father, to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Okay, we're going to interrupt again. What did Jesus say he'd come to do? Father? I came to show. I came to show. Teach men. To teach men about you. What does it say here? I came, God, Jesus came to teach men of the Father, to correctly represent him. Okay. And then you got uh, with Peter, excuse me, with uh, Pilate. He, Pilate asked him, what, what's your, what are you doing here? And he says, it came to demonstrate what truth is. Mm -hmm. Show you the, the truth. And of course, John eight thirty two, the truth will set you free. Yep. What is the truth? The truth about God and his character. What's he like? Not the way a lot of religions and churches and... Uh, um, the Bible translations have made, made him out to be. Yeah. Even some of the Bible translations. Oh. Yes. That's where a lot of the bad stuff comes a, from. A lot of it. But well, then a lot of it just made up. A par they have a paragon, excuse me, a, a paradigm of, uh, that's false and that's pagan. And so when translating from one language to another, there, there's always going to be opportunities for you to say it this way or that way, both of which are acceptable translations. And then... How, which one way? Which way are people going to choose? They're going to choose the way they think fits with their paradigm. That's right. Again, angels. Continuing, Jesus came to teach men of the Father to correctly represent Him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. 
The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Interruption again. The only way was to educate, pay his, no, pay the, the, the debt of sin by giving his blood, right? Wrong. It's not what it says here. To make himself visible and familiar, huh. to set people right and keep them right. We use big words of sanctification and justification yeah. To, yeah. to instead, some big Latin words. That way, everybody can sort of have their own version of what they think it means. Yeah, it's fuzzy enough, everybody, plenty of to spread around. <laughs> to set people right and keep people right is straightforward English. Yeah. And that's what Ellen White used, and that's mm -hmm. what some areas of the Bible use. The Father, was the Father was revealed in Christ as altogether a different being from that which Satan had represented him to be said Christ, quote, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. The men of his own nation, the leaders of the people, were so ensnared by the deceptions of Satan that the plan of redemption for a fallen race seemed to their minds indistinct and in unexplainable. Okay, now let's, she's going to talk to us again. She's going to try to explain it in the straightforward word, the best, most straightforward words you can imagine. Go ahead. Continuing from Signs of the Times, Ellen White. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his mission on earth, to set men right through the revelation of God. There's nothing about blood, nothing about sacrificial death, nothing about substitution in there. So did it say the part partial purpose of his mission? No. Said the whole purpose of his mission on earth. Yeah. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. Is that the same one that we read about up here? Someone was claiming he was arbitrary. Where is that? Severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary? Yep. Same, same section here. Wow. Satan okay. was claiming that. In, in Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, quote, I have manifested thy name. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. That's John 17, verses 6 and 4. When the object of his mission was attained... Now we're going to talk up, up there. It said the whole purpose... The only way, okay. When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world, the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890. Okay, now if those things are all true, is it possible that Jesus made a mistake? Well, and please note that there is nothing about shed blood or about substitution anywhere in those words from Ellen White. Is it possible that the revelation of the truth about God, we're talking about the great controversy here and the, the truth about God's character, was the whole purpose? Is that what you said, Gordon? The whole purpose? That's not what I said. That's what Ellen White said. Okay. God, the whole purpose of Christ coming to this earth. Is it possible that Jesus had finished the work that God had given him to do even before he died or even before the trials and before he was crucified? John 17, 4. Or was Jesus wrong? I hope no one... wasn't wrong. So, the way some, some people's theology is, Jesus had to be wrong. Yeah. But Jesus wasn't. Jesus yeah. was God himself. Okay. Substitution. Here's our something now from a Bible study guide by, by contrast with what we've just seen. Substitution is the key to the entire plan of salvation. This is an opinion. Because of our sins, he deserved, we deserve to die. Out of his love for us, Christ gave himself for our sins, Galatians 1.4. He died the death that we deserve. That's true. We're not, we're not, nobody's arguing about that, I hope. The death of Christ as a substitute for sinners is a great truth from which all other truth flows. Hold on. 
We just read that the great truth was what? The truth about God and his government and how he runs his government. Our hope that of restoration of freedom of forgiveness of eternal life and paradise rests upon the work that Jesus did, that of giving himself for our sins. So what does that mean? Is that clear language or is that dark speech? Without that, our faith would be meaningless. We might as well place our hope and trust in a statue of a fish. <laughs> and guess who we're talking about there? Dagon, the, 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 uh, Philistine, the, the God. Philistine God that they worshipped, the idol that they, some part of them worshipped, was, was a fish god. Salvation comes only through the blood, the blood of Christ. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday, January 8th. June 8th. Would that be hematology? What do we mean by hematology? That's worshiping the blood, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Are you contrasting that with idolatry? I'm not contrasting You're with idolatry. You're saying it's similar to idolatry? I'm saying it's similar to idolatry. And you have oh, bi bi bibliolatry. Sometimes. Oh, okay, let's just look at Romans 8.3 really quick again. What the law could not do because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature. God condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son who came with a nature like sinful human nature. So he came down, he lived as a human being to do what? To do away with sin. To okay? show us the Father. By showing us the Father. Okay, doesn't that seem like a direct way to deal with the problem? And notice these words from Jesus himself again, Jim. Matthew 26 and verse 28, Jesus said, This is my blood which seals God's covenant, my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink this wine until the day I drink the new wine with you in my Father's kingdom. Uh, that word uh, for forgiveness, I think it, it, King James probably says remission of sin. Mm -hmm. If you approach the sin as a disease, uh, what do we need? Do you need forgiveness or you need uh, healing? Hold on here. Let's see if we got it here. For this is by... 26, 28. There it is, remission down there. Yeah. So Many the for the, the remission of sins. A lot of the translations have gone into forgiveness. Everybody, you need forgiveness. No, forgiveness is a given. I mean, it's the way, the way God is. Mm -hmm. But it, he, he's offered healing through education, or which is education's redemption, Ellen White says. So. Well, it's interesting to notice that the so-called blood that he was, Jesus was talking about in this passage was really grape juice. That's right. Ephesians 2.15 says, I'm going to read a couple of quotations here, but now in union with Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And again, the little e there shows by the sacrificial death of Christ. We are brought near. What would it take to bring us near to God? Would it help if we knew that God wasn't arbitrary, vengeful, Unforgiving, severe. Don't to know that be he, afraid of him. Yeah. yeah. And he tells you what in John 17, 23, what eternal life is to know the Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Mm -hmm. Look at Hebrews 9, 14. Since this is true, how much more is accomplished by the blood of Christ, the, the sacrificial death? Through the eternal spirit, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to God. His blood will purify our consciences for useful, useless rituals so that we may serve the living God. Now, we need to understand the, who, who wrote, well, we don't know for sure who wrote Hebrews. I think it was Paul. It sounds like Paul with a lot of uh, fancy Greek from, from Luke mixed in there. But he was, it looks like he was writing to a group of young people who were being trained, young men, I'm sure, being trained to be pastors or missionaries. And then 1 Peter 1.19 it was the costly sacrifice of Christ who was like a lamb without defect or flaw. So we, we, we're not denying any of those things. These verses make it clear that the costly sacrifice of Christ was intended to do what? Bring, bring us closer God. to God. To bring yeah. it in harmony with God? Yeah. 
Okay, Barry? Add one. So we have, hold on, this next quotation again now is from Ellen White, Signs of the Times, July 4, 1892. Go. From these scriptures, it is evident that it is not God's will that you should be distrustful and torture your soul with the fear that God will not accept you because you are sinful and unworthy. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. That's from James 4, 8. Present your case before him, pleading the merits of the blood shed for you upon Calvary's cross. Satan will accuse you of being a great sinner, and you must admit this, but you can say, I am... I know I am a sinner, and that is the reason I need a Savior. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. From 1 John 1, 7, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, in brackets, 1 John 1, 9, I have no merit or goodness whereby I may claim salvation, but I present before God the all-atoning blood of the spotless Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Okay, now that's a very powerful statement. What does it mean? There's a lot of talk about blood, mm -hmm. even in Ellen White. Yes. In Helen White's writings. This is all atoning blood. Jim already told us, atoning comes from the word atonement, or it's that same, and it means at one meant. It means bringing us together. So, does learning the truth about God bring us closer to Him? Especially when we realize He's not severe, arbitrary, exacting, vengeful. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So his all-atoning blood would suggest that his death, his life and his death, teaches us something about God the Father. Go ahead. This is my only plea. The name of Jesus gives me access to the Father. His ear, his heart is open to my faintest pleading, and he supplies my deepest necessities. That from is Ellen G. White, Signs of the Time, July 4, 1892. And Carrie, do you know where she was when she wrote that? Uh, yeah, in Kurenbaum. Yeah, she was in Australia. Yes. Good. Yeah. Where's that? <laughs> Down under. <laughs> Actually, I lived just a few doors up from there for quite a while. They renewed it, and it looks nice. Yes. Yeah. So what promises do you see in this passage? Why is Satan mentioned specifically? Let's go back and look at that. What does it say about Satan? There's two places Satan is mentioned specifically there. Satan will accuse you. Yeah, okay. I guess it's just one in this passage. Satan will accuse you of being a great sinner, and you must admit this. Okay, when does that happen and under what circumstances? Well, he's always accusing us, but yeah. this is most relevant in the pre-advent judgment, what has been called the investigative judgment by some. Mm -hmm. um, when Satan is accusing us in front of the whole universe, Jesus and the Father are saying, no, 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 he's not like that anymore. He's, mm -hmm. he's changed, he's becoming more like me. So what promises do you see in this passage? Why is Satan mentioned specifically and what is God's long-term plan for us? Now, how and, and look at this passage. This is an absolutely incredible passage. What does it say us about us? Say about God's plan for us. Is it that we are not changed at all? We just have God's Jesus' blood spread over us, so the Father doesn't see exactly what we are like, or are we really changed? This Gordon? is from Desire of Ages six six eight by Ellen White. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. So we will be changed, and then we will do what God wants us to. Because we want to. That's right. 
The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. Highest delight. Does that mean doing something, oh, do I have to do that? Nope. Doesn't sound like, does it? Go when, ahead. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him. Hold on. What was Jesus, why did Jesus come to this earth? To let us know what God is like. To teach us about the Father. To let us know what God is like. So what does it say? What, can you read that again? When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Now, isn't that a similar to aversion therapy? Yeah. There you go. In, in many respects, yeah, it could be. It's, and that's part of education. Yeah. Isn't it? What people do, it, 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 let this mind be in you. If you move back up a little bit, it says the uh, of that quotation, uh, the, the spiritual anatomy really is the heart of a person is where you do your thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where your where your sin begins mm -hmm. is when you is your thinking. As, as so, um, yeah. So this sounds like Jesus came to let us know about the Father, to let us know the truth about God, so we can come to love Him. And when we love Him, what happens to us? We become changed. And when we're changed, what happens? Sin eventually becomes hateful to us. That's amazing. This is God's plan for our lives. It's not that we just go on sinning, hoping that the blood of Jesus Christ will atone for our sins. And the, uh, there's quite a lot of stuff in Hebrews 8, 1 to 6, and I'm looking at the clock there. I think I won't read the whole thing. Let me look a little. The, the whole point of what we are saying is that we have such a high priest who sits at the right of the throne of the divine majesty in heaven. He serves as high priest in the most holy place, that is, in the real tent which was put up by the Lord, not by human hands. So what is Jesus doing at the right hand of the of God in heaven? The author of Hebrews, probably Paul, was giving instructions probably to a group of young men training to be future missionaries or pastors. Notice how he contrasted the former work of the earthly priests with the work of Jesus in heaven. Hebrews 10, 4, and 11 tell us that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. Why then does the blood of Christ accomplish that goal? Or is does it? it? Well, is this some kind of mystical or magical transaction that we cannot understand? If you have recently come to Christianity and are first describing the truth about sin and its implications, to believe that Jesus died to pay the price for your sins is surely an attractive message. Now, I would say for beginners, that's, that's a great message. Let's start there. It is very appropriate to tell someone who is burdened down with guilts and thoughts about his or her sinful life. But God's ultimate plan is for us to go far beyond that step as we behold the big picture. Jim? Hebrews 9.24, For Christ did not go into a holy place made by human hands, which was a copy of the real one. He went into heaven itself, where he now appears on our behalf in the presence of God. On our behalf in the presence of God. It doesn't say he's pleading the, the, to the Father to change the Father's mind, does it? He's trying to change our mind. Okay, let's, let's talk about what happens in that judgment. What's implied by those words? What is Jesus doing there? Is he trying to persuade the Father to forgive us? No. The Father himself loves us. Let me just read that John 16, 25 to 27 again. Jesus speaking, this is his last night with his disciples for his crucifixion. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. Now let's see, should that be important? If Jesus is speaking plainly about the Father, would you think that was important? Crucial. Yes. When that day comes, you will ask him in my name. Yeah, we're supposed to do that. And I do not, what? I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf. Because why? 
for the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. So, and we could read on, there's more of the same, but look at the, what happens in the judgment. Carrie? Uh, reading uh, verses 1 to 5 from Zechari Zechariah chapter 3. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest, Joshua, standing before the angel of the Lord. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second. <clears throat> Revelation 12, verse 10, I believe it is, calls Satan the what? Do you remember? Accuser of the brethren. Accuser of the brethren. Here he is in the very act, right? Okay, go ahead. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Okay, Satan is trying to accuse us. And what is Jesus, what is, how does Jesus respond? He says, no, you are the one who needs to be accused, right? Stands his ground. Yeah, exactly. Okay, go ahead. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Let me interrupt there for a second. Take away the filthy clothes. Does that sound like he covers them over with his robe of righteousness? Yeah. No, you take away the filthy clothes. Go ahead. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. He commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and then they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. Okay. The Good News Bible. Now, in this passage, who was Joshua? He was Remember? the high priest at the time. He was the high priest who, along with Zerubbabel, led the first group of Jewish, um, whatever you want to call it, Return. returnees, I guess probably is the best word, returnees back from Babylon, Babylonia, that territory, and anywhere, in fact, the, the announcement from the, the emperor was anybody who wants to go back can go back. And we know from records about how, what percentage of the Jews went home? 2%. About 2% went home. Okay. So that's the first part of the individual. Okay. The you, in effect, are standing there. Satan is accusing you, and Jesus responds not by saying more nice things about you, although he could, but he turns and he accuses who? Satan. Satan. That's what's happening in this judgment. Notice the context now. Daniel 7, 9 to 14. Carrie? While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow, and his hair was like pure wool. His throne, mounted on fiery wheels, was blazing with fire, and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session, and the books were opened. Okay, how many are attending this court session? Millions. Hundreds of millions, <laughs> maybe even billions. <clears throat> During this vision, oh, go ahead, read the rest of it. During this vision in the night, I saw what looked like a human being. He was approaching me, surrounded by clouds, and he went to the one who had been living forever and was presented to him. He was given authority, honor, and royal power so that the people of all nations, races, and languages would serve him. His authority would last forever, and his kingdom would never end. From the Good so, News Bible. So who is this one that looks like a human being? Jesus. Christ. Jesus. Yes. Okay. And so those are the verses that clearly spell out how the judgment actually takes place. Yeah. And again, Satan is accusing us, and God could say, you know, I know perfectly well exactly everything this person has done. And it, Satan, when you finish, I could add some more things that, that would be telling you the truth that you don't even know about, you've forgotten about or something. Yeah. But what does God do instead? Instead of condemning you further, he turns to Satan and accuses Satan. That's what happens in the judgment. Well, Gordon, you want to pick up from there? From the Adult Bible Study Guide for Thursday. Think about what that means. 
we sinful fallen humanity, we who would be consumed by the brightness of God's glory if we faced it now, we, no matter how bad we have been or how blatantly we have violated God's holy law, we have someone who appears in the presence of God for us. We have a representative standing before the Father on our behalf. Think of how loving, forgiving, and accepting Christ was when he, Christ was when here on earth. This same person is now our mediator in heaven. From the Bible okay. Study Guide. Who's he a mediator with and between? Yes. As we remember what you just read from John 16, 25 to 7, 27, the Father himself loves you. He's loving and forgiving. Is Jesus trying to convince the Father or something that the Father, uh, the Father of something that the Father does not understand and accept? If we're going to suggest that, if anybody suggests that, they're saying God is omni not omniscient. Right. Remember that our cases are being presented before the entire universe. Yes. So who needs to be convinced? God already knows. God is not learning anything in this process. Who is learning? The rest of the universe. The rest of the universe are learning. And what are they learning? Is it going to be safe to live next door to this person for the rest of eternity, right? Or are they going to start the great controversy all over again? Okay, 1 Peter 2, 24, 25. Christ himself carried our sins in his body to the cross so that we might die to sin and live for, the right, for righteousness. It is by his wounds that you have been healed. This is a quotation right from Isaiah 53. You were like sheep that had lost their way, but now you have been brought back to follow the shepherd and keeper of your souls. While we may not, under, may not understand fully what it means to say that Christ himself carried our sins in his body to the cross. Did he, I mean, I'm trying to be very respectful here, but in what way does Christ carry sins? Not literally, not in a basket. No. Can't move them around. Well, while we may not understand fully what it means to say Christ himself carried our sins in his body to the cross, it is important to notice in the next verse, that we are to be brought back to follow the example of our shepherd and keeper, Jesus Christ. So we're talking about an example here that's important to us, right? Okay, there's some words here from our Bible study guide again. That would be Jim. Jesus, as both God and man, a sinless, perfect man, is the only one who could bridge the gap caused by sin between humanity and God. The crucial point to remember in all this, though we are many, though there are many, excuse me, though there are many, is that there is now a man, a human being, who can relate to all our trials, pains, and temptations. Hebrews 4, 14, and 15, representing us before the Father. So does that mean that the Father can't relate to us? That the Father doesn't know how hard it is here? Uh, there again, this is an opinion. By is, the, uh, okay, are we to understand from this that the Father cannot relate to our trials, pains, and temptations? Where is his omniscience? I mean, are we serious about this? And what about John 16, 25 and 27? We've looked at already twice. Jesus Christ is standing before God not to affect God's attitude toward us, but to represent to, to and disprove Satan's accusations against us, while providing convincing evidence to the onlooking universe that it would be safe to live next door to us for eternity. So who are the jury in this trial? The rest of the universe. The rest of the universe. God already knows every detail of our lives. Nothing is hidden from him, so that there is nothing that Jesus could say to him that he does not already know. But the onlooking universe needs to see the evidence. They need to hear Satan's unjust accusations and then see the truth as presented by Jesus Christ. Jesus does not cover, cover over the, our, our sins with some miraculous coat that gets him or her into heaven, even though she or he is still a sinner. 
Everyone in the vast universe is there listening to learn the truth about us. Not to be deceived about us. God's government is totally transparent. Jim? No, I'm sorry, this will be Gordon. So, before that, is in the pre-Advent judgment, is the same story repeatedly gone through? Does Satan not learn after the first... <laughs> 133,000 that, yeah. uh, you know, this is a story for these people over here, even though many are on Satan's side. Yeah. So, this from the Bible study guide again. Pray and meditate over the idea of a human being, someone who has experienced temptation to sin, standing before God in heaven. What does that mean to you personally? What kind of hope and encouragement does that bring? Does okay. that imply that God doesn't know again? Okay. So again, I would say maybe to someone who is first coming to Christianity, who hasn't been exposed to these ideas before, it might be consoling to know that there's a human being that maybe understands something about us up there. But remember that human being is God Almighty, the creator of the universe. He knew all about us before the creation of this world. It may be more comforting for us to realize that the one who is standing before the Father, refuting Satan's accusations against us, had at one time walked this earth as a humble human being. But we never, must never forget who he really is. God. Jim. The highest angel in heaven had no power God had not the power to pay the ransom for one lost soul. Cherubim and seraphim have only the glory with which they are endowed by the Creator as His creatures. And the reconciliation of man to God could be accomplished only through a mediator who was equal with God, possessed of attributes that could dignify and s declare Him worthy to treat with infinite with the infinite God in man's behalf and also represent God to a fallen world. Man's substitute and surety must have been man's nature, must have man's nature, a connection with the human family, though we, he was to be represented and as God's ambassador, he must partake of the divine nature, have a connection with the infinite in order to manifest God to the world and be a mediator between God and man. Jesus presents the truth before his children that they may look upon it, and by beholding it may become changed, become transformed by his grace with transgression to obedience from impurity to purity, from sin to heart holiness and righteousness of life. Some among the redeemed will have laid hold of Christ in the last hours of life, and in heaven instruction will be given to those who when they died, did not understand perfectly the plan of salvation. Okay, how many die knowing perfectly the plan of salvation? Only Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So, what are we saying here? Christ will lead, go ahead. Christ will lead the redeemed ones beside the river of life and will open to them that which, while on the earth, they could not understand. But undated manuscript 150. Yes. Back so, in 1891 is when it was. Yeah. Okay. So what's happening here? What, what God is telling us is that he looks at us and he says, are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you gradually growing in the right direction? Or are you moving further away from God? Are you moving closer to God? That's the only thing that God really cares about. And if we're moving closer to God, how long is that process going to go on? For the rest of eternity. Jesus himself is going to be teaching classes in heaven. As part of his instruction to his disciples before their first missionary journey, Jesus said, Carrie, As you confess me before men, so I will confess you before God and the holy angels. Notice that. Not just before God, before the holy angels. Go ahead. You are to be my witnesses upon earth, channels through which my grace can flow for the healing of the world. So I will be your representative in heaven. 
The Father beholds not your faulty character, but he sees you as clothed in my perfection. I am the medium through heaven's blessings, through which, rather, heaven's blessings shall come to you. And everyone who confesses me by sharing my sacrifice for the lost shall be confessed as a share in the glory and the joy of the redeemed. That's from Ellen G. White, Desire of Ages, page 357, paragraph 1. So God, with his foreknowledge, can look at us and say, I know you're like that. I, I know perfectly well what you're like. But in my foreknowledge, I can see what your potential is, where you're going, what you, what's going to happen to you. Notice that it is not only before the Father, but also before the holy angels that Jesus is presenting our cases. If God looks at us but cannot see our faulty characters and only sees the righteousness of Christ and his perfection, does that mean that there is something wrong with the Father's vision? Is his omniscience faulty? Of course not. Is Christ trying to fool the Father? Absolutely not. Or is it possible that the faithful, contrary to Satan's accusations, are truly savable and safe to live next door to for eternity? And then we've got Gordon. You've got just about enough time to read our next quote there. From Hebrews 9.15. For this reason, Christ is the one who arranges a new covenant so that those who have been called by God may receive the eternal blessings that God has promised. This can be done because there has been a death which sets people free from the wrongs they did while the first covenant was in force. Good News Bible. So if the death of Christ really sets people free from their wrongs they did without any change on their part, why doesn't that save everybody? I mean, theoretically, it should be possible, right? Through the sanctuary system, Israel's new relationship with Yahweh was indicative of how Calvary would become a crimson cushion of grace that would counterbalance the stealthy intrusion of human sin. This new relationship would center in blood-sprinkled ceremonial rituals which became the redemptive portal out of which self could be snatched off its throne and crucified. This is the plan of salvation. I hope you can understand those words. Just for clarification, that was from the Bible study guide. Yes. What does all that exotic, bloody language mean to you? When Christ died on the cross, sin was conquered in our behalf. For us, then, to live in that victory, we must die, in a sense, as, 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 as well. We must be dead to self and alive to God. When called by God to Christ, we, are, we really are called to come and die. And I want to, you to think about that. Think about whether you like the great controversy view or whether you like this Old Testament view. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we are so fortunate to realize that the, 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 the view is bigger, broader, deeper, and more appealing than what Satan has said about you or what others have said about you. We're so thankful that we guides who have, have led us to the truth about you. May we accept it and adopt it and make it a part of our lives with the guidance and the help of the Holy Spirit is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.